We at Essex Heritage Heron, and if you're not familiar with our organization, um, we represent the, the nonprofit that is associated with the Essex National Heritage Area. All of Essex County is actually a federal designated heritage area, uh, which means that we really try to connect people with all of the special places in Essex County and all of the historic and cultural and natural resource based organizations. Um, and we um, are doing that this morning by really delving into some of the, the hidden histories um, that um, are here in, in our region, but we might not know as much about. And before we do that, though, we really did want to make an acknowledgement, especially knowing that Thanksgiving is just around the corner. Um, we've been doing really some, some deeper thinking about um, the land that, that Essex County, that we know today as Essex County comprises. I mean, we wanted to acknowledge that that, that land is actually indigenous land. And we're really working on a more formal um, type of land acknowledgement and thinking about these issues more. Um, but we really need some more input from many, many voices. And um, so that's sort of a process for it, but we did wanna make that acknowledgement this morning. Um, so a little bit more about why we have um, put this program into place, Teaching Hidden Histories. Wanted to introduce at this time, Brian Sheehy, who is um, the History Department Coordinator for um, North Andover High School. And he's really the one who, who helped us um, start this program and would love to have him just say a few words about um, the origins of the program. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I know it's kind of a busy time of year. Um, so the Teaching Hidden Histories, I got an email um, a couple summers ago uh, during all of the um, confusion and, and upheaval around George Floyd from a group of former students, action required. And um, in the email, they weren't happy with the education that they had gotten at North Andover High, and they wanted more. They, they wanted they kind of wanted us to uh, to kind of change some things to be more um, representative of what they were seeing in like on their screens. Um, so put together this idea of um, a teaching hidden history. Great, thank you. Everything went black, did I, am I still yeah. on? Okay. You're still on, yeah, I can see you. Um, and so we're, we're so thankful to, to Brian's students for bringing this to our attention and, and certainly to Brian, he's been just a major part of this project. Um, so we try to start each of these sessions with, um, with a quote to help kind of just center us a little bit. Um, so we, we picked this quote from, um, oops, sorry, um, Erica Lee, the question of who actually counts as an American has been a source of constant debate. Xenophobia has been instrumental in creating the terms of permission. And that's from uh, her America for Americans. And really this is sort of at the central um, focus of what we're gonna be talking about today um, with all kinds of different sources that, that Brian in particular has helped us um, accumulate um, and some wonderful um, presenters. Hopefully you had a chance to um, take a look at some of the, the presentations before today. And even if you didn't, that's fine. Um, but that's sort of our big theme. Who is it that has permission, so, so called, to, to be an American, to participate in you know, the, the American uh, experiment? Um, a, a little bit more about our themes. Um, and this is something that um, when we were first starting this series, we wanted to make sure that we were aligning ourselves with how the state is, is encouraging us to be more inclusive in how we're teaching history. Um, and so these are some of the questions that um, we've, been, we've been really trying to keep at the center of this program. And how does the, this exploration um, illuminate how these stories have been hidden in our larger American history um, and sometimes even erased? Um, we want to bring these stories to light. We want to help students connect with the history and keeping their voices at the forefront of our teaching. And that's being responsive, as we learned from um, Ruben Enriquez from DESI, who kind of helped us understand, especially guiding principle two in the mass frameworks, which again is helping us be more inclusive and responsive and critical. And the critical piece is really creating that safe environment for the difficult conversations that we might have with some of these themes. 
Um, so we wanted to just keep that um, at the center of, of you know, our time together here. Um, and then a little more, bit more specifically, we're really gonna be diving into the labor movement of the early 20th century. We're gonna see um, how stories of this um, labor movement in Lawrence in particular, and this context of aggressive nativism is helping us understand some of the lingering problems that you know Brian's students, all of our students and young people and all of us are, are seeing in our world, this lingering impulse to maybe Americanize newcomers and maybe not value workers in a way that um, perhaps we should. Um, so these are, um, you know, big questions for us. Also at the heart of what we're going to talk about today is the role of civics education. And, um, you know, Brian uncovered a set of really interesting sources about um, how in Lawrence, um, in response to sort of this, this idea of this nativist impulse, that there was this big push to Americanize Lawrence children um, in the schools. And, and there are some really interesting sources that we're going to delve into. And we're going to think about how that also, um, you know, plays out today with our civics education, how things changed. And then lastly, um, looking at the change makers and, and even members of the immigrant community today and how, how are um, these issues affecting us um, today. So just for our agenda, we're almost done with our welcome here. We have then our panel with our presenters. And then um, Brian's going to model using some sources with us. Then we'll head into some breakout rooms where you'll have a small group and you can kind of talk about what we've been discussing so far and in that context and maybe take a look at some sources that we've put together um, in themes. Um, if you are interested in PDPs, that is definitely an option. So towards the end of the session, we'll go over that. And um, looking ahead, we are hoping to do another session, um, perhaps in March. And we think this one is going to take a look at some of the later history of Black experience in Essex County, um, maybe more 19th, 20th century history. So that's really exciting. And we're really looking forward to that. We'll stick around afterwards as well if you want to um, talk to us a little bit more. Love to thank our partners, especially the Lawrence History Center, um, many of the local libraries and historical societies. Also great group of sources that Brian was able to obtain from the Immigration History Center and University of Minnesota on um, the advice of Dexter Arnold, who's one of our presenters today. We also wanna thank the National Park Service who've um, been always so supportive of our work and have given us um, some funding to help make today possible. All right, we've met Brian and um, talked a little bit about his students. At this point, really wanted to um, give a shout out to our, our uh, moderator for today, Dr. Brad Austin from Salem State University. So if you wanna say hello, Brad. I don't. Oh, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, Brad. We also have um, Dr. Robert Ferrant here with us from UMass Lowell, who put together just a fabulous presentation with extremely strong images. And hopefully you were able to see that. We have it for you captured if you weren't able to see it yet. But Robert, could you say hello? Good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. We also have Dexter Arnold um, from University of Illinois, who's done all kinds of research in this um, topic. Dexter? Oh, is he is he here? Sorry, he's here, but he's muted. Yes, Dexter, yes. you're on. It's, it's a Zoom call. Someone someone has to say it. Okay, does that do it? We're with you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Dexter. Okay, and we hope, so. okay, thank you. And we hope to have Leslie Melendez. Is she here this morning yet? I haven't seen her on the call yet. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully she'll be able to join us in a bit. Um, also, again, just wanted to thank Ruben Enriquez from DESI, who is very helpful in putting together the program. Um, all right. That is it for the intro. We're going to move along now to our um, panel discussion. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Brad Austin. He's going to lead us into our panel. 
Thanks, Beth. And um, I'll begin by thanking everyone for, for doing this. Um, our panelists, you know, Dexter's joining us from Illinois. People are on parade routes, Lauren is. Um, you know, Mary's in her car. Um, it's, um, it's those, those are just the most obvious examples of the dedication y'all are showing by spending, what's a, you know, maybe our last pretty Saturday morning of the fall um, talking about these important issues. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge that and to, um, to say how much we all appreciate it. Also, since I'm I'm not an essential part of this program. I can just say how much I admire the, um, and how much I appreciate the way that this is um, really an exemplary partnership between the Essex National Heritage Commission, between universities, between archives, between um, cultural institutions, and between um, educators and public and private schools. It's just, this is what we should be doing. And um, I'm just really glad that Beth and um, Brian and others have, have convened us and um, allowed us to talk. So. Maybe just while we've got our cameras on, at least we could just raise our hands and see who's in the room. Like, how many of us are here of our day job? Or are we're here because we represent kind of cultural institutions? Who who we have? Three or four, five-ish people. How many um, classroom teachers? The vast majority, and then a couple of us we've already seen are. Um, our university um, teachers and, um, and other folks. Again, I just think it's great um, as we confront these really important issues that we, um, we have all these voices in the room um, and or in the Zoom, I guess, and that we're able to talk about it. Also um, wanna begin by thanking, uh, you know, Robert and Dexter and, and Leslie, uh, I, I still don't see her right now, um, for, for gathering, um, for presenting these materials to us. As I, I told Robert before we got started, um, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing. I'm, I'm, you know, like that's one of the points of these things is I'm going to screenshot this and and use that quote and you know Dexter, I'm I'm learning from you and, and taking notes and all that. It's just it's a it's a great way for us to get more information. But more importantly for me, at least, it's a great way for us to think about how to how to frame these conversations. And as I was as a way to kind of introduce this conversation, where I talk much less than I am right now. Um, you know, it, it just struck me that if you've read the news over the last 48 hours, you see the obvious connections to the, this history we're studying, right? If it's the John Deere strike um, and the resolution of that and the, 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 the labor, the gains um, organized labor made in the face of pretty, pretty strict opposition um, and the, the types of things they're asking for in terms of of, of wage increases and work conditions sounds a lot like, um, to me at least, Dexter, and you can help us think about it, 1919 and, um, and coming up against large, big international businesses. You know, if, if you read the news yesterday, um, questions of how um, the law can be weaponized, um, how the law is, is not always impartial, um, how um, the law protects some people's free speech and action more than others, um, certainly seems really relevant these days. Um, and also seems relevant to Red Summer, which I was so glad Robert brought into his 1919 discussion and to the discussions of what's happening in Lawrence. And anybody paying attention, it seems like we are, because you're here over the last year and a half, um, knows that we're embroiled in a national debate about what it means to teach patriotic history, um, how our schools, um, how our curriculum, how our classrooms, how our lessons, how our, how our books, how our libraries um, teach, quote unquote, the right or maybe even dangerous lessons. That's, um, there's legislation pending or passed in 24 states. We have presidential commissions weighing in on this. The work we're doing is really important. Um, and these questions are um, essential to um, what we're doing and how we're working with our different constituencies. So it just is, is my way of kind of um, thinking about the different topics in front of us, that's, um, and as I was, I was reviewing these materials last night, that's what was most striking to me. Um, but let's, let's hear from our panelists. Uh, first of all, I, I just, maybe I'll begin with Robert and Dexter, um, just asking you, is that a fair way to, um, to contextualize some of what you've been thinking about and what you presented? Um, does that, this, if, if our overall question is about change makers in the face of nativism, um, is thinking about the, the law, thinking about um, who gets to define what it means to be American, what are American ideals, is that a useful way to get into the topics that you, um, that you introduced to us? Um, Robert, do you mind getting us started? 
Um, sure. Well, I mind, but I'll start. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, never give a teacher room to, uh, to talk. But I think I do think there's a lot of parallels between um, then and now. And I'm teaching um, immigration history this semester at the U UMass Lowell, as well as a U.S. history survey. And I've been trying to not I don't want I never want to do anything in an extremely heavy handed way and say this is exactly like that, because I find that to be foolishness. Um, but there definitely are parallels. And I think in the, to be really brief to open, I think in the period that we're looking at, um, World War I and the immediate aftermath, the state law, the courts, Supreme Court, were all utilized to stifle free speech, were all utilized to stifle arguments against the draft. We know one of the staunchest labor leaders of the period, Eugene Debs ends up in jail because he speaks out against the draft. Um, and he violates certain aspects of the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. And so those things continue after uh, the formal ending of the war, but the state is still, I think, weaponized in a way to push down on the labor movement and as well to paint a picture um, that, and you can see this particularly in the Lawrence related materials, paint a picture that um, Southern and Eastern European immigrants are essentially radicals who won't be Americanized, won't jump in the melting pot and, and come out the other side in a three piece suit. Um, and that um, it's difficult for people to make their way when they're faced with so much of that material every day in the Lawrence newspapers or in the Boston Globe or the New York Times or whatever else people are looking at. Immigrants are denigrated. Immigrants and African-Americans become the, um, the poster people, if you will, for what's, what's wrong in the country and the way for it to be fixed is that you suppress um, those groups of people. Uh, I'll stop there. Well, and so maybe I can, thank you for that, Robert. Maybe we'll use that as a transition to Dexter because those who are protesting, um, the African-American veterans who've returned to East St. Louis or Orlean, Arkansas, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the people standing outside the, um, I think Robert is in your slide, the people standing outside the White House saying, you can't celebrate Thanksgiving, this American, quote, unquote, American holiday while you're in prison for free speech. Um, Dexter, my sense is that many of the, um, the labor activists in, in Lawrence think they're acting on the best principles of American ideals. Um, with freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, um, and that those they're being penalized for it, is um, can you tell us a little bit about maybe how they perceived their actions in that sense? Well, they're you know they're trying to um, improve their improve their situations, and you know, and not just I mean certainly um, you know the economic issues behind the strike because that's the um, um, you know. Um, that's the foundation, but also as, as they get into the strike, there are issues about how they're being treated um, uh, as immigrants, uh, how they're being treated um, in, in, in society, uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the community, and they certainly want, um, um, they, want some, they want something better. I mean, there are, 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 are workers in another interview at Minnesota who say, um, during the war, we were Americans. And now they call us foreigners. And that there's, a, there's, a, there's an anger um, and a frustration over um, this, um, well, being treated as, treated as the other. And, and in Lawrence, there's, um, well, in all the mill towns for that matter, there are two groups of people. There are the English speaking and the foreign element. And the foreign element doesn't mean that uh, you weren't born here. It means that it, it means the foreign element means you're from southern and eastern southern and eastern Europe. And uh, so you can have um, a commissioner in Lawrence, a commissioner of public safety, who is a um, an Irish immigrant, has been here roughly 20 years, never bothered to come, never bothered to become a citizen, even though. That's um, that should have been that was a requirement for hold, holding the office that he does. Meanwhile, you have um, someone, Angelo Rocco, 
He's also been here 20 years. He's a strike. He supports the strike. He'd been a strike leader in 1912. Uh, as soon as he gets here, he become he becomes a citizen. He's part of the foreign element, and there's there's that di there's that dynamic, and it's very much a um, a venomous hierarchical thing. So that's one of the that that besides the um, the six hours pay. People, you know, do are concerned about their treatment and being treated with respect and dignity um, uh, in the community. And I just want to say that really the strike helps us, I think, to understand, you know, the issue we've been talking, you were talking about the that's framed today, that um, Americanism and nativism, um, they help us to understand the strike, but the strike itself helps us to understand how Americanism and nativism play out in the early 20th century, uh, draw, you know, drawing on the, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the video, the video um, the, uh, of, of that, Bob, that Bob did in, in terms of the, um, of the whole, um, uh, you know, World, World War I and the super, super patriotism. And I will stop there. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I, I appreciate it, Exter. And, um, you know, one thing that really struck me is, as I was looking at the materials and thinking about today is the ways in which we have kind of concentric circles of, of understanding here. We have, um, although Leslie doesn't appear to be with us now, we have her kind of personal experience as, as someone whose, like, family chose names based on how they would be perceived. Um, and, you know, so their teachers their parents chose her names she said so her teachers would pronounce them correctly um and they would be seen as be more american and she she talked about what it what it meant when she finally figured out what people were saying when they said oh she's from lawrence um growing up in in the 80s and 90s so we have the kind of the the, the you know dexter's kind of lawrence specific this is what's happening in the strike committees this is what's happening here this is what's happening at this woolen mill in this year um, in the, the World War I context, to kind of Roberts, this is what's happening around the world. These kind of, these are great ways, um, different levels to engage as, as scholars ourselves, but also as teachers with, with our students on these questions of what are they really talking about when it means to someone's an American or a foreigner? You know, as Dexter, like, you know, that the example of two people right there came over at the same time is such a great kind of teaching example for us. Um, to think about, um, well, this guy speaks English and is siding with the establishment. He can be American. Um, this other dude can't or isn't, although he actually is an American. Um, anyway, I, I just think that as a, as a teacher, I'm taking notes. Hey, use that, steal that. Um, Brian, you looked like you had a question. Did you have one? Yeah, um, I think it kind of touches a little bit on Robert's presentation. And um, if I, I think I put it in... Um, the sources. Dexter's thesis is 900 pages of really interesting stuff. Um, so I, I, I guess my question to both of you is this, this presentation is, is very Lawrence based. Um, there were um, different strikes. I know there was one in, in North Andover in 1913, but this period, this, this early 20th century period around World War One, can you talk about some of the, the other, um, I guess labor up like uprisings, labor um, strikes that happened in the general Murray Mac Valley area. Take it, Dexter. Uh, well, you know, probably the most important strike, the most famous strike, is the nineteen the nineteen twelve Lawrence Bread and Roses strike. But what's sometimes not realized is that in the aftermath of the 1912 Bread and Roses strike, which really, you know, will set the stage for 1919, 1919. You have a major strike in, in Lowell, uh, another one, week, an, one month strike by, um, you know, led by um, the industrial workers of the world in Lowell. There's um, um, unrest in, in Manchester, in Nashua. Uh, in the aftermath of that, of that Lawrence 1912 strike, there's a, there are major um, strikes in Clinton, Mass., in, um, uh, in Hopedale, um, uh, Mil Milford, Mass., um, throughout, throughout Rhode Island. So, you know, it, you know Lawrence in 1912 really is a, um, 
a springboard for people who say, hey, they won in Lawrence and uh, we want the same thing. Uh, and then certainly there's a continued um, ep episodic unrest in, you know, in Lawrence in, uh, in 1916, where um, um, Joseph Etta, one of the leaders of 1912, uh, comes, back, comes back, is invited back to help out by the workers. And you know, he's warmly greeted on the streets. And the next morning, 5.30 a.m., uh, a squad of police bang on his door at the Needham Hotel, and he's on his way to Boston. Um, I mean, that type of thing. But also in 1919, uh, there's a, the Seattle, Seattle General Strike uh, backing um, uh, uh, shipyard workers. There's um, a several month long uh, the great national national steel strike in the fall of 1919, and again there you see a a, a, sit, a, a split somewhat similar to what happens in Lawrence because the core of the 1919 steel strike is Southern and Eastern European immigrants, and it's the failure of um, um, of, of significant numbers of um, uh, of old, old immigrants, uh, um, you know, America, American born, uh, Irish, German, uh, others who, you know, the failure to um, ally, ally with them that weak, weakens that strike. There's major, major, major calls, major coal strikes. I mean, there's just, you say, you know, 1919 is, I think it's the, the, um, the second largest um, strike wave before 19. Uh, 50, um, 1940s, 90, 1946, I believe is, is bigger, but it's, 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 it's massive. Well, the other, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing that, that, that happens, um, is that those strikes are of, to the people who oppose the strikes as Dexter was just describing, they're overtly linked to the, and I'll put it in quotes, the radicalism of Southern and Eastern European immigrants. And so this argument keeps being made over and over again. See, these people aren't like us. They don't get it. They don't get us. They're not equipped to understand the constitution. They're not equipped to understand voting. They, they basically don't understand what it means to be a citizen. And then you get in Massachusetts, this craziness where the Boston police go on strike. And the headlines in the Boston Globe and in other newspapers are Bolsheviks take over Boston Police Department. Now, nothing could be further from the <laughs> truth, but the headline in the Globe, Bolsheviks are running the Boston Police Department, really puts the fear of Jesus in a lot of people. Um, and so, and again, this goes, this, the trail here is important because in the late 19th, early 20th century, the seeds are being laid for immigration restriction. And this commission, the Dillingham Commission, gets set up to study the impact of immigration in America. And they produce this 40-volume set. Um, and they have, a, they have one that's about Lawrence, which is actually really good as a primary source. Um, but essentially, they lay all the problems in America at the feet of immigrant populations. And immigrant populations' inabilities to um, homogenize, again, for lack of a better term. And when the war happens, it sort of postpones what I think of when I teach this as the inevitable, which then happens in 20, 1921 and then in 1924, where there's very specific, very targeted quota systems put in place to restrict those Southern and Eastern European immigrants that ideologically and culturally a war has been uh, perpetrated on um, for nearly two decades. And so this has been driven into people's heads um, for quite a while. And it, get, it has that culmination point in 1924. And now you know, if you're an Italian, like my, my grandfather, one of my grandparents, my grandfather comes from Italy. He goes through Ellis Island. His last name is Sambrano, C-I-A-M-B-R-A-N-O. Shouldn't be that hard to spell. But when he gets to Ellis Island, the people that sign him in can't make out what he's saying. And they say, you're now Mr. Brown, B-R-O-W-N. And the, the, his exit papers from Ellis Island have Brown. 
And I know this because I went and looked at his um, looked at the ship's manifest where it's Sam Brano. And then when he's when he's processed through and leaves, he gets to Philadelphia and he says, yeah, screw Brown, I'm Sam Brano. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's just part and parcel of this um, vendetta, if you will, against um, against the other. And then again, it's manifest powerfully as well toward, uh, I mean, Native American populations are still being warred upon during this period of time and more and more confined to um, small holdings of land. They're being moved from their, from their ancestral land still. Um, and African-Americans, obviously, as Brian mentioned earlier with East St. Louis, or somebody mentioned East St. Louis, and this is when you get to Tulsa, the Tulsa riot, um, and you get a whole bunch of other things. And so there's a, this, I mean, this is a, one of my students the other day said, so what you're telling me is between 1915 and 1925, if you throw in the flu pandemic there as well, because we talk about that, the country was on the verge of falling apart. It would have been really easy for people to think the country was falling apart. I said, yeah, I think you're right. Some people definitely thought that was the case. Good on you for, <laughs> for realizing the chaos theory here. So um, as you know, as a teacher, um, one of the things I often I really talk about the importance of 1920. And in fact, I think the, the new mask curriculum frameworks begin the US2 class around 1920. And um, but often teach a grad class that's really kind of, you know, reconstruction through 1920s. And we start with 1877 when it feels like the world's falling apart with a general strike and end with, you know, 1919 when it feels like the world's falling apart. And then using that, as, as Robert said, to set the stage, um, there's just so much going on at this period. You know, for those of us who are looking for kind of ways to kind of dig in and teach this stuff and to use the materials Robert and Dexter and others have given us, you know, you think about talking about labor, you're talking about, um, you know, urbanization in 1920s being the key point in the, um, for the, the Census Bureau, um, certainly immigration and forthcoming immigration laws, the, the red summer of, of, of 1919, um, the, the boarding schools, like you said, Robert, for the Native Americans being in full swing, um, and all this comes together. It's a really effective way to kind of dig in and, you um, and pulling all these threads at once, so your students um, can can really understand uh, and the best way we can in the classroom some of the chaos these people these people felt. And one way I do that is I do talk about the Klan in the twenties in Massachusetts. There's a book, and I was looking for it on my shelf. I think it's called "Not a Catholic Nation," um, which has a chapter on the Klan in Massachusetts um, and the anti-immigrant focus, um, anti-Catholic, anti-Jew focus of the Klan in Massachusetts. There was a gun battle. You know, 20 miles from here. Um, who was it? I think Robert said there are 500,000 Klan members in New England. Right. Um, you know, these are these are all things that um, our curriculum frameworks ask us to talk about, and our students are are probably interested in, in exploring with us. You know, why is this? Why would there why would there be such a surge? Why at this time? Um, I saw in the in the chat. Um, I think it was Lauren had a, a question. Lauren, would you like to ask that, or do you want me to, to read your question? Lauren's still muted, so I will read Lauren's question. Um, so Lauren's asking, I know there's a push in World War II to naturalize parents of servicemen, you know, to kind of give their parents credit for their children, um, quote unquote, you know, acting American. Um, after World War II, did this happen in, um, in World War I as well? Or did military service convey um, citizenship or at least the, the sense that these people were truly American? I know it didn't for African Americans when they returned. I don't know. I won't even hazard it. I should not even hazard a guess. It's bad form. <laughs> I don't know. Next, do you want to guess? <laughs> uh, I'm with I'm I'm with Bob <laughs> uh, on this. You know, I, I, I've never heard of it. That doesn't mean this isn't where my reading has been most extensive. Um, it's a really good question, Lauren, but I, I I'm afraid I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, in to respond a little bit deep, more deeply, I think that if it, if indeed that happened, we would have, um, between all of us, run across it somewhere in the variety of different immigration history texts and things that we take a look at. It doesn't strike me as maybe it happened in some small way, but I don't, I don't feel like it was something where this was really 
heavily advertised if you're if if you know if somebody in your family is fighting in the war you can you can easily become a naturalized citizen i i, I don't yeah I don't, I don't see the linkage yeah i agree and so you know as as a teacher i think well that's that's a really interesting question because you could ask you know what else could these people have done to prove their loyalty to this nation besides risk, you know, be willing to kill and to die. I mean, both things are big ask. To be willing to die for something is something. Being asked to kill for something is is really um, significant ask as well. I mean, what else could they do to prove their commitment? Um, if that's not enough to um, to give this kind of grant of citizenship, um, that tells you something about the tide. And then, of course, the laws that emerge, you know, the immigration quota laws that emerge shortly thereafter, um, I do think we would have read about if it happened. Um, yeah, I mean, and also to sort of think it through a little bit more, as you said earlier with African-Americans, I mean, there are incidents in Washington, D.C. where, um, you know, Black people who served in the war come back and in uniform are lynched yeah. um, in, the, in the streets of Washington, D.C. And part of the spark, I think, for a lot of the Red Summer um, is that a lot of people had fought in the war and said, wait, you're sending us over there to fight for freedom and all these other things and then we come back you're telling us we can't vote we can't buy a house we can't go live in this neighborhood whatever um they're, they're more um they're more able to think that through and because they've had um these experiences abroad they come back and they're more determined than ever to really push back and so the vehement i think the vehemence with which something like tulsa takes place where even airplanes are used to drop incendiary devices on the black part of, of Tulsa um, is indicative of the fact that people realized they needed to stamp out all of this resistance as quickly as possible. That if it ever came to pass that these um, labor strikes and things that were occurring could in some way be linked up to some of what was happening in, in black neighborhoods and some more broad based working class multiracial coalition could have been built. This could have been a really powerful moment in the, in, the early in the early 1920s to change in some way the course of history, but that never happened. The movements were so violently put down that you really do, I think, have this period of quiet into the 1930s where the desperation of the Great Depression um, pushes people sort of to get their head up out of the out of the hole again and say, okay, maybe it's time. Um, so I think a lot of people, because of the violence and the way like the, the in Dexter's talk, the picture of the machine gun on the back of a, of a, of a truck or whatever, I mean, like, nothing's going to chill you being out in the streets than seeing a machine gun being pointed at you. Uh, at least for me, that would probably make me go home. Um, so it really, it, 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 the, the, because one, one of the things my students have asked me is when we talk about Tulsa, why, why burn the entire neighborhood? Why basically just level the entire neighborhood the way it was done and the way you see in the photographs? And I, so I turn it back on them and say, what do you think? And eventually they get to the point where they say, well, it becomes a really good example of the power of the state if you step out of line. And I'll usually say, thank you. <laughs> you're making my point. <laughs> um, and I get them to make it instead of me saying this is an example of, but if you question and sort of pedagogically sort of keep pushing, they get it. And then they say, oh, okay, so you don't have to do this everywhere. But if you do it in three or four significant places, if you have Chicago, if you have Tulsa, if you have East St. Louis, if you have, um, was it Rosewood, I think it is in Florida, if you have four or five of these places, you don't need to do it that much more. Everybody else sees, okay, if we do this. Well, this again, the, um, the, symbolic, the symbolic power of lynching. You know, we said that, you know, 3,000 people will show up to, to murder this person ritually. Um, it's, it's a spectacle more than it is just, just a killing. Um, I, I see a great question from Mary that I want to ask. But one thing I would point out, Robert, um, that I got from your presentation um, when I was talking about the basically the blockbusters, the people who moved in the neighborhood in Chicago, and they're like, it's 50 kids in that one house that they had ransacked. They didn't destroy the whole neighborhood. No, the houses on both sides, if y'all remember that picture from the presentation, it was a house an African-American family moved into that had been targeted for destruction by this crowd of basically white school kids or teenagers, it seemed. Um, and then they, they, they had a pose poke picture taken in front of it. They didn't destroy the whole neighborhood. They targeted one house and the houses on either side were completely left alone. 
it's um it, it, it can be widespread and destructive and it can also be really really focused um yeah can i just add, add something here um uh, i think that you know there's a great concern um in 1919 and, and afterwards about americanization of of veterans about 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 um sh being sure that they're um, they've been shaped shaped the right way. I mean, I mean, certainly that's part of the impetus behind behind the American American Legion. I mean, yes, the Legion is um, you know a way that um, some of the soldiers will connect with themselves. But there are also statements by um, you know pro prominent uh, prominent pe prominent people. Um, Major, Major, uh, Major Knox will eventually become Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of the Navy. And he's talking to uh, mill owners about, you know, gee, you know, we really need an organization to shape the attitudes of vets. And, you know, in, in Lawrence, there's um, an appeal to the um, uh, army to come investigate these uh, uh, people who are wearing their uniforms in strike demonstrations, and that's not just in Lawrence. That that's in Winnipeg, Canada, uh, uh, just before the general strike. Uh, that's in Butte, Mon in Butte, Montana, which is uh, really under under military control from uh, 1918 until the very early 20s. It's in it's in New York. It's in New York City. Uh, there's some guys. There's some guys who've been in France, and they're back. And they're not with the program, so let's call the provost guard, and um, you know, at the very least, have a have a talk with them and tell them that it's that they are the ones dishonoring the uniform because they're um, challenging their employer um, because because they're stepping stepping out of line, and um, maybe they do need to be disciplined in the south by by, by lynching because they they forgot the. Um, um, the racial code of uh, of um, re of the redeem of the redeemed South. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's you know there is that concern about uh, you know how veterans are going to be are going to respond and that and and it's and I, I think that ties into the way people have seen uh, draw draw rather draw on the World War One culture because um, in 1922 there's a strike. Um, New England, New England cotton textile textiles, and um, in one city, not Lawrence, uh, there's discussion about well, will the chief of police receive the I, receive the Iron Cross at the um, uh, at the annual meeting of the of the mills? Uh, I mean, I mean, basically, um, uh, call, and, and calling calling the head of the mills the Kaiser and all of that, and this really is you know. Not not the way the not the, not the way it was supposed to work. I mean, not the, not the way they're supposed to uh, take that um, uh, you know uh, wartime sentiment and um, how American is supposed to work with that. Well, I would just say um, I, want, I want to get to Mary's question real quickly, but also I mean, there's there's a long there's a thread we can no pun intended for Lawrence. There's a thread we can pull on this throughout American history, whether it's you know, Colonel Shays, you know, um, in Western Mass saying, you know, veterans saying, hey, we fought yeah. for something. I'm sure we fought for this. Um, Frederick Douglass saying that, you know, once African-American soldiers wear the gold eagle on their shoulders, no one can deny their citizenship to these people in Lawrence, to African-American veterans after um, World War II trying to vote in Georgia and having gun battles, to um, to Vietnam veterans against the war. There's, there's a long history of people who say, I've done everything I can for this country. I have a right and say to say how it um, operates. Um, and that being pushed back, which gets back to the bigger questions here of who gets to decide what's an American ideal when they're in conflict with each other. Um, these are the big questions we can explore as, as teachers at, um, and students ourselves, but also with our students. We're about out of time for this session. I wanna to get to, um, to Mary's question and see if Robert or Dexter have anything to say about this. Um, Mary's asking about the cyclical nature um, of nativism um, and wonders if it's um, predominantly driven, do you think by perceived economic threats or more kind of, I guess the opposition, if not just economic, you know, economic anxiety, is it um, maybe a loss of cultural power or, um, or something else? Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's I think it's both. 
but I think that um, when these things begin to percolate, it's oftentimes when there's been some economic dislocation and the economic dislocation is used and, and the, the quote unquote offending group is blamed for the economic dislocation. You're unemployed because of, you're not making as much money because of, your factory isn't open because of. And so then that's used to then begin to create. There's a great book um, my students read on, uh, on the Chinese on the West Coast called Driven Out. And it really talks about how the labor market um, comes to play here where Chinese workers are welcome before the civil war and immediately after to mine gold or build a railroad or do whatever. But in the various panics post the civil war, all of a sudden there comes, you know, okay, now we have to get rid of them. And the title Driven Out actually talks about the fact that white communities were organized to physically drive those Chinese communities um, off their land, off their farms, out of their businesses. And, and when you look at what happened, it's, it, the violence is much, more, much greater than the internment of the Japanese during the Second World War, but it's quite similar in terms of the xenophobia, in terms of the attack on Asians as being the other. Um, and it's incredibly violent and people at, at all levels of government and security participate. And the book is terrific for sort of helping people. My students love the book because it sort of pulls um, through. And then when we talk about internment, we can go backwards and say, remember when we talked about this. And so it really works well. The other veterans thing, and then I'll stop is don't forget the bonus army. The bonus right. army says, Jesus, we did all this shit during World War One, and you, you promised us a bonus in 1945. We'll be dead before 45 because people are at the depths of the Great Depression. And then the military is used. General MacArthur and, and, and Dwight Eisenhower basically run veterans um, at gunpoint out of Washington, D.C. So, but I think it's both. I think these things connect back. The, the economic insecurity connects back and, the, and it's e they're easily manipulated things. They're, for me, they're like two sides of the same coin. Robert, thank you so much for that. I, I can't believe I forgot to bone star me. Um, my dissertation and second book's on the Great Depression. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I apologize. I, I, um, that would be I, a reason I, to forget. <laughs> um, I, I began this part of the, of the agenda by thanking you for spending your time with us. We want to respect your time and are going to try to stay on the agenda. Um, especially want to thank Robert and Dexter for helping us lead this discussion. Um, you're, of course, you're welcome to stick around and participate uh, more, but I think we're going to transition, if that's all right, Brian, um, looking at the clock, um, to your part where, where Brian's um, who's going to work, show us some of kind of how he uses some of these sources. Is that correct, Brian? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so take us away. All right. Can everyone see that? Um, so I wanted to look at um, displays of patriotism. Uh, one of the things that I know, I know Dexter really gets into in his um, thesis is the God and Country Parade, and and Robert really mentioned it in 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 his. And this these displays of of patriotism, and I think that that it's very interesting to to look at how and why, and and to kind of at, like ask our students how and why um, we should look at patriotism in, in some of the symbols and in, in all of that and, and what's the meaning behind a lot of the ideas of patriotism. And I'll start with this image here. Um, I, I wrote a chapter in a, in a book on, on sports and, and critical media literacy and the use of, of patriotism and in and, and that um, around World War I and when like World War II. And when you look at patriotism and these displays of patriotism, you see Uncle Sam, you see the flag, you see um, the eagle. Okay, a lot of that um, are, are purposefully meant to kind of, of portray a certain image. So if, if I was to do these kind of things with my students, I would definitely use some of the thinking routines, um, see, think, wonder. And then I think the next piece is what makes you say that? I think when, when we examine, whether it be objects, whether it be images, um, photographs, posters, I think that it, it, it's that next step. Oh, I see an eagle. Okay, well, 
what do you think about that? And why do you think that? And, and, I, and, I, and I think that that's what we have to do with our students to really kind of draw out um, the, 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 like the real learning, you know, what makes you think that? And, and, and that kind of processing and, and understanding why they have come to that conclusion is really where the learning takes, like, takes place. So the first one, um, I, I, I guess a little context might be needed. Um, after the Bread and Rosa strike, um, there were threats of, of anarchism and, and um, God is, I, I don't know the exact quote, uh, Robert or, or, or Dexter could probably give it to you, um, but essentially it was, it was that God is dead and, and you know, this, is, this was challenging God. Um, so, and, and obviously we've talked about how a lot of this radicalism in these, in these strikes challenged, um, challenged American, uh, what it means to be an American, you know, you're not kind of following along and, and doing what you're supposed to be quote unquote. So, uh, this is from the original, um, God and country parade. And I would just ask my students, what do you see? And, you know, hopefully they would pick out, I see a bunch of flags. I see, I see women. I see um, the, the image of the eagle. You know, I see people marching in straight lines. I see large crowds, you know. Um, hopefully they would see some of these numbers, you know. 32,000 enthusiastic paraders with 14 divisions, 20 bands. What is that meant to show? Brian, can I interrupt one second since we, sure. we do Dexter still here? Um, the God, is this, do we think that's, um, is that against like the perceived godlessness of, of communism that's going to come up in the 1950s, do we think, or is it just, um, is it, wh what do you make of the God part of that? The country part makes sense to me here. It was um, promoted by, well, by a priest, but I'll let Dexter, he knows much, like much more than well, I do. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reaction. I mean, it, it, follow, it follows, you know, first of all, it follows along the opposition uh, to, the, um, to, the, to, the, to the winter strike. And there have been discussions. Um, the mayor had suggested, well, maybe we ought to have like a patriotic gathering and, um, um, and, and, and draw on the Catholic church to do that as, as a way of continuing to push back about the activism in the spring. In the in the um, in the fall, there's a, there's a, there's a demonstration be, uh, the day before um, the um, the trial of, of two strike leaders, and there's a group from from either from Boston or, or Lynn, um, Italian, uh, pretty definitely Italian anarchists, and they carry what is essentially an, an, a standard anti-death penalty sign. Um, you know, about, about the 20th century and, you know, the, the guillotine, the hanging and all of that. And at the bottom, there's a, sta a statement, anarchist boilerplate, um, um, no God, no master. And the, um, the civic leaders in Lawrence pounce on, pounce on this, um, you know, godless, uh, un-American, and actually, God really gets overshadowed in, in this whole thing. I mean, as the um, as as Brian's um, display uh, photo says, you know, the flag parade, and they because they and they really emphasize the flag and the patriotism and the Americanism. And yes, God's there, and that's you know drawn on by some but by, by some of the a a actors. But they really make it you know literally a flag a flag parade. Thank you, Dexter. I'm sorry, Brian, to interrupt. No worries. Um, now we're going to fast forward to the anniversary of this parade. And I think that this is where it gets really interesting. And I wanted to show everyone these images because um, I think that when you, when you think about coming to a, a, um, a professional development like this, you're learning about 1919. This stuff connects to it, um, and it's from the Cold War. So the 50th anniversary of the God and Country Parade, um, you have these kind of, of um, advertisements in the, in the local newspaper. So the Lawrence Eagle Tribune, you have um, kind of, of these kind of things kind of diminishing the role that the Bread and Roses strike had in um, Lawrence history. And I think if you guys look at, at some of the um, first articles that I think Beth shared with you with with like everyone 
this like this history wasn't celebrated um, 40 years ago. Um, people did not talk about the Bread and Roses strike 40 years ago. Um, it was something that people were not proud of, and, and it kind of is 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 the um, the like the whole crux of of why we're doing this, right? We should kind of of be examining and in looking at our histories, even if it is uncomfortable, even if it is hidden. Um, I think we need to talk about those like those things so we can grow. And over the past 40 years or so, with the studying of the bread and roses strike, think about how much scholarship has has gone into um, examining labor strife and, and kind of getting to the to the bottom of of in kind of re, like re-examining how we view that portion of history, specifically in Lawrence. So again, I would um, ask my students to kind of take a look at, at some of this and you see communism, you see atheism. And I think that, that then I would ask them, well, why in 1960 are they talking about that? How does that set the context of the time period? And I would really kind of analyze and, and, and break down some of this. And again, you see some, some imagery, you see the flag. Then I show some of these pictures and you have Pedro Francisco for God and country. And what's that person um, in the center? What is he dressed as? This person here with like the hat. What what time period do you think he is? He uh, he's from Brad. Golden timey, colonial. Colonial, probably, and that's going to be a recurring theme that we shall see. And I'm going to go ahead a couple to the, like this one. And why is that? Okay, again, you're making that connection between um, the founding of this country, the cel like this uh, celebration of democratic ideals in, in all of that, and um, how the 13 colonies shouted, Congress is free, free and independent states. And again, kind of connecting that past to the present um, and, and kind of making that connection to um, the founding of this country and um, the pledge and, and like all of that and, and kind of the very um, Americanism and Americanization that you can see here um, in, in kind of looking at, at that connection, but I'm gonna go back to, to this one. And again, you see your uncle Sam, communism is in, our, like in our time is bad. You know, there's a lot of stuff here and you can break down and analyze, God bless America. You have the imagery of, of uncle Sam, um, you know, bring the whole family. This is a family friendly event and, and it really could, could, could do some interesting things breaking these kind of images down with your students. Then these are the really interesting ones that I saw. Uh, don't shake Khrushchev's bloody hand. Um, and freedom fighters, and you have the connection to, um, to, to God here. I think with the 1960s one, you get a little bit more of, of the God stuff um, because again, and you could have a discussion with why that is. And, and you know, um, some really interesting things that, that you could talk to your um, students about, you know. Uh, but this but this one is a really good image and i would definitely break that down with my students smash I'm, communism very khrushchev, khrushchev. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry brian just just watching franny trying to turn her head to um to read what was on the side of that car about um about poland was really interesting uh, <laughs> well it, just i'm sorry brian but yeah i mean i because this is polish i'm polish yep. And okay. brought up Catholic, this is really much deeper than just American. Yes, you could get into, I mean, you're talking about um, the whole sol the, sol the solidarity movement in like the 80s. Um, oh, yeah. And that like <laughs> back and forth. So yeah, there's there's so many ways. And, and, and this is kind of the cool thing about doing something like this is you could bring in so many different connections with these sources. And again, as we were going through this and, and Beth said, we want something um, for this for this time slot, I thought it was really important to kind of highlight some of these because there's so many other ways um, some of these sources could connect to, to people's classrooms. And if you're teaching like or like a world history course, you could talk about um, Eastern Europe and in in Poland and all of the other um, countries that got swallowed up by <laughs> Russia. Coexistence with communism is suicide for America. 
it's, it's, it's just kind of really interesting. And if you, you know, I, and if I was to continue to show some of these pictures, you have like missiles getting um, delivered down the street. And it's a very, and, and you could ask your students, why is that? I mean, when, when we think of that kind of overt um, displays of militarism, you don't really think of the United States doing that kind of stuff when you're talking about the cold, like the cold war. So you can have like some interesting discussions with your students about some of that. Um, and again, I think that there's more religion tied to, to this uh, 1960s version. Communism is a smash communism everywhere. You know, I, I, there's just some really interesting stuff in some of these sources. And then to tie it back, and I know Robert used this image in, in his presentation, but there's a whole series of, 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 of these that um, were published in um, 1919. And you have some really strong images here. You, you, you have that soldier standing in the back that represents American ideals. And you have Uncle Sam uh, kind of in a like in a wheelchair and why is he in a wheelchair is american idealism is america under threat and uh, you know and he said my boy um do you stand for the principles this fellow has been fighting for and i do and i'll be a real citizen to prove it and it, it it's just kind of it it really kind of brings it all together of of what we've been talking about, and this this uh, this feeling of of having to Americanize, having to to do what you're told because America told you to do so, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And then just to kind of tie it to today, and. Again, I, I, I teach a couple of sports classes, and I know that in my sports class, um, during the Colin Kaepernick um, kneeling or, or not kneeling, we had some interesting discussions about um, the flag, the meaning, um, overt patriotism, patriotism, and people have very um, diverse ideas on what that means. Um, I think that when you start connecting it to today, it's a lot trickier. Um, and, I, and I think that one of the things um, kind of going back to the original slide is see, think, wonder, and then why do you feel like that? I think that if you can establish an atmosphere in your classroom where um, people can express their ideas, and if you can express why you feel that like that way, you have to kind of have that discussion with your students. Is you may not agree that Colin Kaepernick should have kneeled. Okay, or should kneel during the, the national anthem, but Johnny over here is entitled to his opinion if he's able to defend it. And that's how civil um, kind of civil uh, back and forth happens. And, and we need to have that dialogue. We need to have that discussion. So those are, I, I just wanted to highlight some sources kind of just quickly um, kind of go back and forth on some of the things. If anybody has any questions quickly before we go into the breakout rooms. Um, we can do that. Brian, I just point out that Bruce um, pointed out in the chat how many of these ads are from banks and about, you know, so, you know, capitalist institutions supporting democracy and defense of an attack on communism. There's a lot going on in that part of it, too. Definitely. Um, it, it, there's, I would definitely suggest going through all those sources, a lot of um, credit unions, a lot of, of banks. Um, there's a lot of things that you could easily um, connect and, and have really deep discussions with. Well, speaking of looking at sources, Brian. Wow, what a transition there, Brad. <laughs> I'm here for one reason, one reason only. Um, and that's to, to, to not talk and to get us to the next part. So Beth, do you wanna introduce what's happening next or? Sure, so we are gonna have some time now to, to have some discussions in smaller groups um, and to even actually look at some of the sources. I hope you will take a look at the website where all of the sources have been highlighted that have been compiled for this session, but we pulled out just a few of them for um, deeper examination. So um, I'm gonna just, I'll share my screen briefly just to kind of show you what to expect. Um, so if you've been with us before, this will look familiar, but you're going to be um, uh, going to, you're going to see a uh, group of slides here and I can grab that link for you and stick it into the chat. Um, this group of slides will be uh, numbered, you know, so if you're in uh, breakout room number one, you're going to travel over to slide number one and you can put your names there and then you're going to click on a link that will take you to some sources. 
So um, I'm just gonna actually, I can click on it here. And so you can see what you'll go to. Um, so here you'll see um, some sources in a theme and you can click on those links as well. And then we have some um, suggested questions, but um, honestly, it, when you're into your, into your group, you can just talk about whatever you would like, whatever is on your mind. Um, just thought this might be a little food for thought for you. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we hope that those discussions were helpful and that you're able to um, have all kinds of ideas swirling around. And if it was about like what you might do with students or just kind of processing some of this content, but we'd love to take a, um, a few minutes here just to kind of uh, debrief a little bit, right, Brad? Yeah, yeah, and I, I joined group one for a second or two, and um, they were taken in completely fascinating, fascinating direction. So, um, you know, Beth, you were just saying something about the gender dynamics here. I'm going to ask you to, to, to continue with that. And then Christine, as a material scientist, is looking at from a very different perspective. Um, I think it may, if um, and Miss Miranda also had stuff to say too, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beth, do you mind continuing the thoughts you were just just playing with? No, I don't mind. Um, we were looking at the uh, the plan for education, and it it read more like a pledge for teachers. And it struck me that the audience is, and probably was predominantly female. And looking at some of the footage and the the photos from our primary resources. Um, we see a, a lot of women up front on both sides. Um, those, those union, it, you know, bread and roses, all of the history of Lawrence was championed by mothers worried about their children. And, um, and yes, the men needed to bring a living wage, but the women were, um, were massively affected. Um, they were the heads of households, uh, households, and the the language. I was I was just pointing out the language within the plan, talked about uh, I talked a lot about um, masculinity, and um, and that this is all about uh, bringing things to the to be a strong man and um, and bring it to the uh, to the bosom of that that male patriotism. Yeah, thanks, Beth. And that's something, Brian, I think you and Beth were talking about when we were in our little small group debriefing about the kind of the, the masculinity of a lot of the imagery of the, the, the 1962 stuff. Is that, Beth, were you noticing that or? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Beth White, thank you so much for, for those comments. Because I was, I was thinking, you know, a lot of this idea of, of, you know, what is it, what are our American ideals, you know, smashing these are all sort of very um, male identified, um, perhaps uh, views about what it is to be American or, and sometimes that gets, um, you know, pushed together, like sort of masculine ideals and, and American ideals in a way that that's pretty evident in some of these sources. So Beth, thank you so much for, for pointing out that, you know, women and, and you know, families were so affected um, by, um, by the labor unrest and, and we don't always, we're not, you know, maybe always thinking of putting those voices at the forefront. So I think that's really important. So can I also ask Christine to say a word or two? Because one of the things we were talking about earlier is how we all benefit from having different perspectives in the conversation from, from teachers at different levels, the cultural institutions. Um, Christine comes to us, I think it's, you said it's material science background um, and just read completely different things into this. And it was fascinating. Christine, do you mind sharing? Yeah, sure. Um... So yeah, I'm a material scientist and I, um, I work with historians of science and technology. So we study um, landscapes, technological landscapes and instruments and um, the Merrimack Valley and other locations. And um, what I really um, was interested in is um, of thinking about all these embedded values in these documents and how they translate into the technological systems that we study in the Merrimack Valley. So that includes things like the um, water power, um, the multi-scale materials design of all the systems, the water, scientific water instruments. And so um, I posted a paper that we published recently on um, sand filtration, looking at the materials at multiple scales and thinking about how these core values are embedded 
in um, that particular system and then uh, impact the broader um, social fabric of the community. Currently, we're working with the Lawrence History Center um, and looking at specific um, uh, types of scientific instruments, um, which were made um, locally there, but I, I'm just fascinated by this and it just gives so much foundation and richness to expand on the work that we're doing and how those um, mindsets manifest in technology that creates inequities. And also I was saying that it's so relevant to some of the leading technologies today. I mean, we still struggle. Every technology that we're building um, creates massive social inequities. And so our thought is like the only way that we can really understand how this happens prior um, is to change, you know, what we're doing now based on our, you know, understanding um, broadly prior, but um, I mean, it's a real challenge. Um, Thanks so much, Christine. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Fascinating. Yeah. Do we have others who would like to share a little bit from their group discussion? We'd love to hear from you and, and what, it, what all you pulled out from some of these sources or just from talking to each other. And maybe, maybe tell us a second a bit about the sources you considered. Yeah, raise your hand perhaps and then unmute. So um, we were chatting about um, the photographs and really thinking, especially with all of the news this week, about how they were sensationalizing it and desensit and how desensitized we can be now. Um, so I come from the Cape Ann Museum and we have a lot of these historical materials. We have a lot of um, archival imagery and archival newspapers, although I was very, very jealous that these are all digitized. I know that's something our librarian and archivist is putting major efforts into and I can like see what will be possible for us as more and more of it is digitized. Um, but yeah, really thinking about, you know, we looked at an image of somebody who had been uh, attacked under Lynch law in Lawrence, um, and it was a very brutal image. Um, at, but I will say within current experience, it's kind of desensitized to it and trying to put myself into the shoes and try and walk the idea of walking students through, especially here as a museum where we're, we present visual objects. Um, what does it mean? What would it mean then to see an image like that? What's the difference between now and then? Um, so that was something that we chatted a little bit about. Wendy, I don't know if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of our overall discussion where we went. And um, part of one of the other images, uh, you know, we, we had to focus mostly on the titles and the descriptions. And one of them said something to the effect of like, savage Cossacks attack strikers. And, you know, it was an interesting image to look at, but it left us with, we feel like more questions than we have answers for because, you know, it, it took a lot of time to take a photograph. So we, we don't see active violence, but you can't, you know, in 1919, probably capture, you know, an act, an act of violence um, as easily, right, as today you can get move, movement images in, in great quality. So, um, we just thought that it would be really interesting for students to kind of unpack maybe where that title came from, maybe what's missing, maybe look at other written sources to sort of fill in those gaps, um, like start with the image and the title to get students interested in the topic and then go to the, the print materials from there. Um, and then same thing with, with the image that Miranda mentioned, there was um, a written account um, a narrative um, of this man that had been brutally attacked. Um, and it also reminded me there's a description of Abram Colby when he's attacked um, during reconstruction. Um, obviously different situations, different time period, but some real parallels with um, the kinds of brutal beatings and, and treatment that people um, have experienced. Thank you so much, Wendy and Miranda. Um, Bruce raised a question that I was thinking along the same lines is that how great is it that um, we could talk with our students about, is this intended to raise a question? What questions do we have? You know, getting back to Brian's kind of, I wonder where else might we have to look to find this? We get, it becomes a, a research kind of um, primer as well. It just, these are, um, and I know in, in museums, the idea that, that 
the the art, the images, the collections raise questions instead of answering all of them is is really important. Um, so I, I I love what y'all are, are saying and doing with these things. Brad, I think that also ties into to current times, like sound bites. What you know, how much context do you lose with sound bites and with a Twitter feed and and things like that? And it's meant to just get people going sometimes. Yeah, clickbait is I think what some people would call it now. But yeah, it's um you're exactly right, Bruce. Exactly right. And that's again, that's a way we can connect with the content. We can also part of what we're teaching is teaching media, media literacy. We're teaching to be more informed and kind of questioning thinkers and readers, consumers. Um, using sources like this allows us to do all of these things to check all those boxes. Thank you. Who else? Ryan. Yeah. Uh, so Tom and Rob, Tom, Rob, and myself, we looked at this uh, image for a little while. So I just put it in the chat. Um, in which yeah, there's a lot of parallels to a lot of the critiques of like Black Lives Matter protests. So we talked about it on, on a number of levels, but the initial calls for like law and order and delegitimizing the goals of the protests and like for the purpose of the strike and focusing on like the implications of like threats of destruction of property or violence amidst uh, the strikes. And again, it opens up the question of like, well, who's perpetuating the violence? Is it like state actors? Is it police? It is the protesters and the strikers themselves. Uh, and the point of view of the piece is in essence, especially with the visual image of the um, woman uh, pointing away uh, or pointing towards the lawlessness as like the central issue instead of the actual demands of workers and saying, we can't really fix these demands unless we solve lawlessness. Uh, I think there's a lot of tie-ins to you know, things that you see in like Fox News editorials and, and things like that, that delegitimize the goals and purposes of Black Lives Matter protests. And for students, like they've seen a lot of that in the last five years. Um, so that fits a pattern that, again, was here 102 years ago in 1919. Ryan, have you uh, talked about some of these contemporary issues with students as, and have those discussions gone if you have? Yeah, I mean, uh, really the, my entire teaching career over the last 10 years, I guess my third year teaching was like the summer of Michael Brown and Ferguson. So when you teach, whether it's a civil rights movement in the 50s or 60s, and you can use like the, um, the patterns of using uh, phrases like outside agitators or like these outsiders are coming in. Like I've just done the Little Massacre recently in my classes. And like John D. Rockefeller uses that phrase like outside agitators and so it fits this pattern where um, people who are protesting or people who, for the most part, are nonviolent are then reframed as being outsiders or being radicals. And then like the calls for actual like concrete material benefits become delegitimized or they become like a secondary issue. And then the, the questions of like the, the legitimacy of like protesters, the legitimacy of different protest techniques and tactics, like that's all that we can like, it's various times and different units you can tie into current events. Um, so one of it's appropriate, you can make those connections. But oftentimes students will make connections themselves like in their reflections or journal entries where you'll see it. Uh, they may not say it in class necessarily in discussion, but they'll say it um, in like reflective pieces. So the context matters, but um, students often make them themselves in terms of connections. Ryan, I'll jump in. I, I really appreciate that answer. One of the things that struck me is you're talking about like, connecting to the 50s and 60s, that a lot of these things that Brian found have, are published by citizens committees. And of course, you know, talking to anti-civil rights, you know, citizens councils are such a big thing. You know, the framing of the, the anti-protest um, as being a body of citizens um, working against presumably non-citizens. There's, there's a lot to be done with the, the, the focus on citizens are trying to stop this, I think. That again, that again, that maybe another one's threads we can pull, we can pull through. And Brian, um, some of the sources that that we found were where Brian found more recently, um, really are giving us more like the strikers' perspectives, and they are on the website. I don't believe they were in any of the breakouts um, just as it happened today. So um, we really want to call attention to those sources. I don't know, Brian, if you wanted to just say a couple of things, and we could even show you where they are on the website. 
So the Anthony, um, I think it's Caparori or something like that. Um, the Minnesota library uh, was awesome. They scanned like 200 pages for us. And the past couple of days, they just gave them to me, I, I think on Wednesday or Thursday. So in the past couple of days, I've gone through um, the couple hundred pages and there's just such great resources of um kind of uh different flyers um different uh different letters that were like that were sent um from from the perspective of of workers you can see like attention workers here's your chance um i thought it was cool there were a couple things in italian too that um matched up the english so it kind of shows you uh trying to appeal in a bunch of different languages to all the different uh workers um, yeah yeah so check those out. There's some um, letters by strikers. And I think this idea of, you know, kind of pushing back on this, I, you know, that who, who are you citizens to call me a non-citizen? Um, so that might pair well with some of the, the other sources that we've been discussing. And I see that Brainy has her hand up. I do. And I, I made a comment in the, in the, um, in the chat. It also, I, just to tie into how class conversations go, I found teaching uh, the City University of New York, I teach primarily, or I taught <laughs> way back, I taught primarily first-generation students um, that are extraordinarily diverse. Some of them are immigrants, some of them um, first-time college students, whatever the case may be. Their reactions to these are very um, personal and very different than when I was teaching at Texas A&M, which was predominantly to a white classroom of students who quite honestly did not give a crap about others. So I think it changes the conversation when you're having this in some place like Queens or the inner city in New York City where I am the only white person in the class and they bring their experiences to the classroom. You know, because I taught a lot about protest art and you know, Black Panthers and Emory Douglas in my art history classes and these students who a lot of them were part of the Black Lives Matter protests really grabbed a hold of this and took it personally. So I think that really frames our discussions in the classroom and we really need to be mindful of that. And that's why their voices are way more important than our voices. Absolutely, and Ms. Miranda, uh, I know teaches in Salem High off down the hall from me sometimes um, and um, may let you chime in there for a second. I will just point out as we're organizing this, we tried, um, Leslie Melendez um, was supposed to be with us. Um, personal situations prevented her from being able to join, but she is someone, and I hope you got a chance to watch her video about what it was like to grow up um, in Lawrence as um, an immigrant family, uh, a member of an immigrant family, and um, to be the target of a lot of this Americanization um, educational programs. So. We were trying to and had planned to um, to include some of those voices in this presentation as well. We just it just didn't work out, um, um, and we hope we can hope everyone will watch that video at least because we think um, hearing her voice is incredibly important. Miss Miranda, you were nodding a lot to, um, to what Franny was saying. Do you want to um, maybe have the last word on this? I, I guess yeah. I just because of uh, the student population that I work with, you know, we are an urban school district, and so. You know, I'm the, you know, the entitled white woman, right? And, you know, the kids do not look like me. And the discussions that we have, we, I can, luckily, I can, the kids want to have these conversations, these controversial topics. And I'm, I'm in it to teach hard history and they know that. And so at the beginning of the year, I build, you have to build trust with them though. You build relationships and then once they learn to trust, they start to have more engaging conversations and begin wanting to have those deeper and sometimes darker conversations. And you have to be open to that. And, um, you know, that's probably one of the more most rewarding parts of my job is to see that growth in the kids when they want to have those difficult conversations, uh, particularly around race. Um, again, because these are kids, I'm, I'm the minority in the room. And so I will continue to do that <laughs> as Brad knows and advocate, you know, whatnot. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, it's 
um, as I look at the clock, I realize we need to, to probably wrap this up. But I think one of the most rewarding parts of, of our jobs and who helped organize this is working with other folks who want to do the work, who are willing to spend their Saturday morning to prepare themselves with more information and some teaching strategies and the, the network with others who also want to bring these histories into our into our, our students' classrooms and their lives so they can see themselves as being worthy of study and as someone who's contributed to our our, our, our nation's past. It's, it's incredibly important work um, every year, but especially these years. Um, so once again, we'll conclude where we started by, by thanking you for, for joining us and being willing to, to engage. And we hope that this session you know, gave you a couple more resources, a couple more ideas, um, a little more um, confidence and urgency to do this work. There's some other kind of house cleaning things we need to say before we go. Brian, Beth, what else needs to do we need to say here about um, what's coming up or just um, the PDPs? Anything else we need to conclude with? Yeah, I just put um, a link into the chat that uh, we would love for you to click on. It is just um, helping us to show that you are here and that helps with us with our funding. So if you could please just fill out that attendance form. There's also a, a section there to provide feedback to us as well, which we'd really welcome. Um, so I'll ask that you please do that. And then yes, um, if you are interested in PDPs, that the PDPs are available. Um, if you go to the website, um, I, I'll quickly just share it just so people can see it because I know there were some people interested. If you go to the website, there is, um, uh, can you can you see my screen now? No. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if you go to the website and you go to PDPs, um, you will see uh, the directions for how to um, fill out a form, basically, and uh, and obtain ten PDPs. Uh, basically, it just asks you to kind of relate the. Um, um, materials and our topic today to something that you might do with students. So that's right there on the website and it's just a form that you click on. Um, we also, as we mentioned at the beginning, we are also um, really excited that we think we're going to have another um, Hidden Histories workshop coming up in March, um, exploring Black experience in the 20th century, a little bit of 19th, 20th century. So um, we'll be doing all kinds of preparation and uh, we'll alert everyone to when that's coming up. Um, and other than that, I think we are good. Anything else, Brian or Terry? Oh, well, can I jump, just a minute, can someone posted, can we share the link again to the website in the chat? And also, can you remind us if the website has um, resources from previous workshops there as well, or is it just this one? Ah, all right. So what I'll do, I'm going to send you a different link. This is going to be a link to the larger um, mm -hmm. website that houses all of the um, materials from all of the workshops. It's on our Using Essex History site. So it's just using essexhistory.org, which takes you to Teaching Hidden Histories. And there is where you can find um, links to all of uh, the past workshops materials. So let me stick that in the chat. This is the Using Essex History, which is kind of the umbrella that we have for um, all of these um, opportunities. It even has some stuff on using Essex history from that um, initial program that, that Brad and Bethany Jay and others had put together years ago. Um, so there are even more materials. So that is probably the best one. If you go to that using Essex history site, you'll see the section that's more for teaching hidden histories, which have been um, where, where we're housing uh, materials from the past four sessions more recently. Where you'll find the same kind of kind of primary sources, local history connections, um, fantastic, really engaging topics. But trying to do the work again that Franny was talking about, um, we're 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 trying to do it, and we're working with teachers to do it. And have Brian especially, but others have prepared a lot of resources to help teachers, um, you know, bring these these topics to their classes. So I I encourage you. It's fantastic work they've done. I um, incur can take no credit for it at all. So I'm no feel no shame in bragging about it. Um, it's really worth spending 30 minutes and just photocopying and downloading and um, using the class. Yeah, just want to give a shout out to Wendy Waldron as well, because yeah. she created some really great videos that are you'll see there. Um, uh, she created some lessons that um, she talks about. Um, I think Rob Michaud's uh, lessons are also on there. So again, when you do, um, uh, if you apply for the PDPs, 
Um, we love to see what you do with students. We'd love to hear how it goes with students. And we had some opportunities last year to, to have some follow-ups uh, conversations about that because it, it really does help um, for all of us to, to support each other in this work. And that's really the point. So thanks for coming. Enjoy your Saturday. Um, keep doing the work and let us know if we can help you. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Bye, y'all. Thank, 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 thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Be good. Thank you so much.